There is a law we don't have to obey. American Cassette Ministries welcomes you to Part 11 of the Breath of Life Crusade Number 2, as given in the greater Washington, D.C. area by America's most powerful evangelist, Pastor C.D. Brooks. preached about God's law and in the heart of it is his holy Sabbath and if ever the Bible was clear it's clear on these subjects I even challenge you and I didn't do it to be facetious or smart but to make you think I challenged you to find me one text of scripture just one indicating that God doesn't want me to obey his Sabbath, or his law. And I told you that if you got me one scripture, I would join a Sunday church Sunday. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it? If you think, you know, some folk don't think. But I believe my audience thinks. Now, beloved, I've gotten three or four questions about Colossians 2.14 and I told you we were going to preach about that. And that's tonight. That's tonight. Well, let me begin by telling you what I've already told you. And that is the devil. Who? How many of you want to join the devil in anything? How many would like to be on the devil's side? Well, I want you to know whose side you're on when you hate God's law. Because the devil despises God's law. The reason is that if people start keeping the law they'll stop lying and stealing and running around with other men's wives and other women's husbands devil doesn't want anything like that happening so he hates God's law now he's got a mini pronged attack against that law he can't deal with everyone in the same way he does another. So he has many approaches to disallowing and discrediting the law of God and the word of God. And one of his successful devices is this. He wants you to think, even you who love Jesus, even you who respect God and want to serve him, the devil wants you to think that God does not mean what he says. Do you hear me? That's what he wants you to think. He wants you to think that in spite of what God says, folk, folk, not God, but folk, they can sort of fix it up and set it up the way they want to. That God is not particular. That he is not really interested in what he said. He just said that for some crazy reason, but he doesn't really care. Isn't that incredible? Now I'm going to make another in statement that is astonishing. When you get right down to it, there is only one commandment in ten that all these churches and religionists despise. Do you hear me? Now I'm going to prove that. I'm going to tell you what the ten commandments are. And I want you to think now. As I go through them, I want you to think, and you will agree with me, that everybody practically believes nine. There's one great communion that has moved out two, but most everybody else believes nine. Now the first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You thinking? They all believe that, don't they? The second commandment says, Thou shalt not make images and bow down to them. Now there's one other big church that says, well, we'll do that. But all Protestant churches believe that you shouldn't worship an image. They all agree with it. They got nothing against that. The third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And they all believe it. Am I right? I want you to witness now. Now I'm going to skip the fourth commandment. And I'm going to the fifth. Honor thy father and thy mother. 
Do you know of any Christian church that doesn't believe in that? You think now. I'm not trying to ram anything down your throat. The next one says thou shalt not kill. You know of any church that doesn't believe it's wrong to kill? The next one says thou shalt not commit adultery. You know anybody who doesn't believe that? Any church that teaches it's all right to commit adultery? The next one says thou shalt not steal. That's eight. The only two more. You know any church that believes in stealing? Are you thinking with me? The next one says thou shalt not lie. Do you know any church in Washington or anywhere that teaches it's all right to lie? The next one says thou shalt not covet. That means you shouldn't be envious and you shouldn't covet what belongs to another person including his property and his wife and his car and his house. You know any church that doesn't believe that? Now if you are intelligent and you are, you will have to admit that the nine commandments I have given you, all churches believe nine except one. They believe eight. So what do they mean when they stand in the pulpit and say, the law is done away with and you don't have to keep it? What do they mean? Do they want me to come to their churches and steal the sound equipment? You know, I could use some sound equipment. Frankly, I don't like that piano over there for my meeting. We rented that piano and I don't like it. And I can tell you Mr. Kilby didn't like it when he was here. I could maybe go to one of these big churches and steal me a baby grand. Huh? Listen to me. We in the churches are largely responsible for the lawlessness of society. We have taught people to disrespect God's law. And if we've done that, why should we expect them to respect man's law? We've told people you may break the law with impunity. Sin is what? Transgression of law. And we're telling people you may do it with impunity. With impunity. You don't have to worry. Beloved, everybody believes in nine. Now, if I quoted one more text, it ought to suffice. James 2.10 Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And that's the New Testament. Now that's the way my religion has to be laid out. I don't want a lot of philosophy. I want the truth. My heart hungers for the truth. What about you? And I wouldn't preach unless I could do that. I wouldn't preach anything I didn't thoroughly believe. And I'm preaching <laughs> with compassion. There's only one commandment that they don't like, and that's the fourth, that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We have encouraged lawlessness because of our disrespect for one law. And that one law is the one that God says is a sign that I am God. And so the devil is striking at the very central issue of our faith. That God is God. And that's why so many folk go to church and still believe they came from a monkey. And that's why people believe, even Christians, that they can get an M1 and go into the army. And being in the army makes it alright to kill folks they don't even know. Are you listening to me? And that's why tonight people feel that they can do almost anything and still remain a member in good and regular standing. And God will understand. He certainly will. I can assure you he will. The devil's problem is he wanted to be God. And he got kicked out of heaven because of that devilish ambition that got out of control. God tried to win him back. God tried to save him. But you know you can go too far. And eventually he went too far and was expelled from heaven because he said in his heart, I will be like the most high. Now he's always coveted worship. He has coveted the prerogatives of God. He, have, he has coveted the honor due only to the God who created. Devil hadn't created anything but misery. God created.
created him, Lucifer, an angel. He is not a creator, but he wants to be God. Now, when he came down here, he knows that there's one commandment that honors God. And in trying to turn that honor from God to himself, he went after the fourth commandment. It's not just a quibble over days. When people say, what's the difference in a day? They don't understand. The issue is not just a day, not just 24 hours. The issue is honor due to the true God. Would you say amen, beloved? God says it is a sign that I am the Lord. Now the devil and his imps have gotten together and someone has put with their imagination a few words to it. And the devil said, how can we get people to break the fourth commandment when everybody likes a day off? <laughs> you can't take the Sabbath away altogether. After all, people like to have a day off. In fact, there's some folk who want six days off and seven. Folks are lazy. And they enjoy holidays. And so the devil said to his imps, what can we do to attack the fourth commandment without taking away that day off? Because they want a day off. And uh, this person's imagination had an imp answer. And the imp said, let's get man to change the Sabbath. And let's fool the people. And another imp says, and if they begin to pin us down with the Bible, then we'll use a text. And the text will say, let no man judge you in Sabbath days. We'll use another text that says, we're not under the law, we're under grace. <laughs> Beloved, Jesus said, who said? Jesus. Are you taking notes? Please do. Check it in your Bible. I've had some responses from people who say they do that. One person went home, stayed up half the night looking up some text cells. I like that. Oh, I want you to get your sleep, but that's important. The Bible spoke of the Bereans and said they were more noble than those at Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, if you want to be noble and clear and intelligent, search. Make sure I tell you the truth. Amen. Jesus said, who said? Luke 16, 17, Jesus said, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Would you say amen out there? What is a tittle? In the Hebrew, it's like the crossing of a T. A jot is like the dotting of an I. And the Lord said, not one T will lose its crossbar until heaven and earth pass. Now Jesus said that. Not only did Jesus say that, but in Matthew 5, 17, he said... Think not. The understood subject is you, and it is an imperative sentence. You think not. In other words, don't you even think that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And the word for fulfill is found in another section, and it meant to preach and to demonstrate. Would you say amen? You see, the Jews had attached a lot of extraneous laws to God's law. They said that if a man carried a burden, and it could be as little as a handkerchief, on the Sabbath, he was breaking the Sabbath. God didn't say that. They said that an ox got in the mire, you could pull him out, but if a man got in trouble, he had to wait till sunset. God didn't say that. And on the Sabbath, Jesus told a man, take up your bed and walk. Now that bed must have weighed something. And when he picked it up and walked, instead of them thanking God for the miracle, a man who had lain by a pool for 38 years was walking. Instead of that, they got mad because he was carrying a few pounds on his shoulder. Jesus said, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. I have come not only to preach the law, but to demonstrate how it is to be kept. Good deeds have no Sabbath. Would you say amen, Isaiah? Now, beloved, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Let me go on. In Matthew 5, 17, he said, don't even think that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Then he says in verse 18, verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall in any wise pass from the law. And in verse 19, he said, whosoever therefore shall break one. Break how many? Whoever shall break one of these least commandments. What does that mean? It means after you read them, pick out the one you consider to be the least important. And Jesus said, whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever will do and teach them, the same shall be called great. Would you say amen? Now that compounds the problem a little bit. I'm really creating a problem for you. 
For after reading that, you want an explanation to Colossians chapter 2, and I'm starting with verse 14. And here we come. Listen now, I want you to hear this. Colossians 2 and verse 14. The Bible says, it says, blotting out. Doing what? Blotting out the handwriting. That's a key word. Remember that. The handwriting. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. An ordinance is a law. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Uh, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Don't let anybody judge you in meat and drink and holy days and Sabbath days. Now you got yourself a conundrum. What in the world does that mean in light of what you just read? Is the Lord contradicting his own word? Let me make it worse. Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm reading verse 15. I want you to listen. The Bible says, talking about Jesus, having abolished in his flesh. Abolished? You know the word. Done away with. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, twain means two, one new man, so making peace. Now we made it worse. We are confused now. What in the world does it mean? Well, I've got to hasten on, and I'm not going to keep you in suspense any longer. Let's go to the meat of it and see what in the world the Bible is talking about. I'm going to 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 8. And the Bible says, Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do all that I have commanded them, and, and is a coordinating conjunction. Connecting words and phrases of equal rank and importance. I learned that in grade school. Now listen. God says, I'm going to let Israel stay home if they will observe all that I have commanded them. And according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded there. You got it? We're getting into the answer now. The Bible teaches clearly two laws. Would you say amen out there? Now I'm going to turn to another scripture and I'm going to read it and I hope you'll write it down. Nehemiah. What book did I say? Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 13 and 14. The Bible says, Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai. Now you know who that was, don't you? That was God. Thou camest down upon Mount Sinai and spakest with them from heaven and gavest them right judgments and true laws and good statutes and commandments and made us known unto them thy holy sabbath and commandest them and here's that end again and commandest them statutes and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant have you got it? God came down and gave a law then he commanded laws by the hand the hand of Moses thy servant he blotted out the handwriting. Oh, it's going to get clearer. In Deuteronomy 9 and verse 11, write it down. It says, Yea, all Israel transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses thy servant. Huh? There it is. It says Israel broke your law and the curse written in the law of Moses, thy servant, is poured out upon us. In Exodus 24, 4 to 7, you read about this law that Moses wrote and the Bible says it was written in a B-O-O-K. What does that spell? And it was placed in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. But when you read about God's law, It says in Exodus 31 and verse 18 that the law was written with the finger of God on two tables of what? Stone, that's right. 
God's law on stone. And when you engrave something in stone, it suggests permanence. It means it can't be erased and it can't be obliterated and it can't be switched around. God wrote his in stone on two tables of stone. And Exodus 31, 18 says he wrote it with his own what? With his own what? But Moses wrote the rest of it in a book. And instead of putting it in the ark where God's law was, it was put in the side of the ark. Now what was there about Moses' law that made it different? Moses' law was written in a book. It contained military laws to tell Israel how to fight. It contained some yearly Sabbaths. Oh, you thought that was talking about the seventh day, didn't you? Leviticus 23, write it down, study it at home. Leviticus 23, verse 5, verse 24, verse 32, verse 39. You will read about some extra Sabbaths, and they are called annual Sabbaths. What does annual mean? They come once a year, just like your birthday. But God's Sabbath comes once a what? Every seventh day of every week of every year is the Sabbath of the Lord. But these annual Sabbaths came only once a year. And they were days in which the Jews did not work. They were days in which the Jews went to church. They were days in which the Jews did just like they did on the true Sabbath of the Lord. Now, they came on dates and not days. God's Sabbath comes on a certain day and not a certain date. Have you got that? Now, whenever, you know like Christmas is the 25th of December, sometimes it's on Sunday, sometimes it's on Monday, sometimes it's on Tuesday, sometimes it's on Saturday. Is that right? Now, that's because it comes on a date, the 25th of December. These yearly Sabbaths came at specific dates. You'll read that in Leviticus 23. Whenever a ceremonial Sabbath happened to fall on the seventh day of the week, the Jews claimed a special blessing and they called that day an high day in Zion. Have you ever heard that? That's what it means. If Passover, which is a ceremonial Sabbath, that weekend, if it fell on the true Sabbath of the Lord, it was an high day. They got the blessing of Passover and all the ceremony connected with that. And they got the blessing from God for observing the Sabbath where he promised to come and be with his people. So they called it a high day. Would you say amen? And there are several of those. And uh, suffice it to say, uh, they came once a year, but God's Sabbath came once a week. Now, ladies and gentlemen, God's law is called perfect. Psalms 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. But over in uh, uh, Hebrews 9 and verse 9, the Bible tells us that Moses' law couldn't make anything perfect. Would you say amen out there? If you read Romans 7, 12, Paul, the one these folks use all the time, says the commandment is holy. It's what? Holy and just and good. But in Hebrews 8 and verse 7, Paul says Moses' law was carnal. It dealt with carnal offerings and so forth. Meats and drinks and Sabbath days and new moons. Have you got it? Do you know that Moses' law said that all men had to go to Jerusalem three times a year? I'm glad God nailed that to the cross because I can't afford to go to Jerusalem three times a year. Not from here. Would you say amen out there? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, how clear it is. Well, what was distinctive about Moses' law and what was distinctive about God's law? Here it is in a nutshell. Moses' law was written only for the Jews. God's law is for the universe. Would you say amen? Let me illustrate it. How many of you have ever heard of the Constitution of the United States of America? Say amen. Now, over in Russia, they live by our Constitution. Is that right? They don't. Well, why don't they uh, observe our constitution in Russia? I think it's clear, isn't it? Our constitution is for our country. We need not expect Russia to live by our constitution. They got no Bill of Rights. Amen? We can't expect France or Spain to enforce our Constitution. It was written for the United States. But God 
God's law, thou shalt not steal, is for decent people in Russia. It's for decent people in France. It's for decent people in Spain. And for all those who want to be decent. Would you say amen? God's law is universal. It includes not only this earth, but heaven too. The devil broke God's law. He offended the first and second commandment and the third and all the rest because when you break one, you're guilty of all. He was put out of heaven for doing that. We certainly are not going to get up there doing it. Would you say amen out there? God's law is universal. Moses' law was for the Jews only. It was concerned with types and symbols and representations. Every time a man killed a lamb, that man was representing Jesus, the Lamb of God, by faith. Now, once Jesus died, do you have to still kill lambs? Isn't that plain? And so, ladies and gentlemen, there is a law in the Bible. And by the way, I don't want you to misunderstand me. This law was given to Moses by God. Would you say amen? It was transitory. It was temporary. Temporal. It was good for that time. Until the day of reformation, the Bible says. But what was the day of reformation? That's when the true came to take the place of the representative. That's when the substance came down to replace types and shadows. Well, who was the substance? Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. The one that was promised before Adam and Eve were ever created. For he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And when Adam sinned, what a mess he was in. He was scared to death until he heard God say, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. I'm going to send a Messiah. I'm going to send somebody to pay your debt. Well, Lord, when's he coming? He's not coming until the fullness of time. So in the meantime, you kill a lamb. And when you see the blood flow, you know that that lamb didn't sin. His blood is flowing for your sin. That is simply a representation of the fact that one day my son will come and his blood will pay your debt, Adam. And once he comes, you don't have to kill any more lambs and bulls and goats. That law of Moses was concerned, concerned with bloodshed. And folks were killing blood. Josephus says but at the time of Christ, they were killing 250,000 lambs a day at Jerusalem alone. And the priests spent their entire lives with fire and smoke and blood trying to atone for the sins of the people who were sinning so liberally. Jesus died and said, it is finished. What's finished? The plan of salvation is finished. It is finished. A way has been made and the plan is ratified. What else is finished? The shedding of the blood of bulls and goats is finished. Jesus took that out of the way and nailed it to the cross. Would you say amen? I think you ought to say amen every time I mention it tonight. I'm glad that he shed his blood once and for all. And I don't have to go around killing lambs anymore. For there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all that guilty stain. Christ is our Passover, said Paul. Therefore, I don't have to observe the Passover. This is the end of Side One. Please turn over the cassette now for the continuation of Pastor C.D. Brooks' message entitled, There is a Law We Don't Have to Obey. International Copyright, 1986 American Cassette Ministries. All rights reserved. Once again, here is Pastor C.D. Brooks. I think you ought to say amen every time I mention it tonight. I'm glad that he shed his blood once and for all. And I don't have to go around killing lambs anymore. For there is a fountain filled with blood. 
drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain Christ is our Passover said Paul therefore I don't have to observe the Passover I don't have to go to Jerusalem for that Amen By the way there are our brothers the Orthodox Jews who did not accept Christ they still observe Passover you know that's true and every year on their Passover, they blow the ram's horns and they go to church. Now, since it comes on a date instead of a day, sometimes it's on Tuesday, sometimes it's on Thursday, it, it can be Sunday, it can be any day. Once a year, they still go to the synagogue for Passover. Well, the reason I don't go is I know something they don't know. I know that one day the Son of God came down to earth and because he loved me so, he made a way out of sin into eternal life. He is our Passover. He is the ladder that Jacob saw stretching from earth to glory. He is the connecting link between God and lost man. And through him and his body and his blood, we may pass over from death to life. Christ therefore nailed that to the cross. Would you say amen out there? Don't have to keep that. Then there's the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, they call it today. They still observe it. Every time you know that, some of you work for these people. They're good people. And every time Yom Kippur comes along, those who still hold on to their heritage close their shops. Isn't that right? Why do they close the shops? Because it's a Sabbath. Are you listening? They don't sell anything on their shops. On Yom Kippur, you know, it's a strange thing. Many will keep their shops open on the Sabbath of the Lord. But when it comes to Yom Kippur, once a year, they close shop. And if you used to buying your suits from them, you go there wanting the suits, you got to wait. They are all at the synagogue. Why? The yearly date has come for atonement. And they have the sacrifice and some of them have made modern adjustments and they do other things and they drink a lot of wine and so forth. And I'm not putting anybody down. Please don't you misunderstand me. But I'm telling you what we know. We know that the Son of God came to make atonement for our sins. The word atonement, if you look at it, is actually three words in one. At one meant sin separated us from God. We were diametrically opposed to righteousness. Everything God stood for was everything we were against. And we couldn't help our rotten selves. But the Son of God came down. And with one hand, He reached out and caught a hold of us lost humanity. And with the other hand, He held on to divinity. And He brought us together at one minute. And He made one. Reconciliation is a word that comes to us through the grace of God. Atonement. The only way we can be one with God is to be without sin. And the only way we can be without sin is through Christ. To have his blood shed and wash our sins away. And when it's washed away, it's gone. That's why Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. I'm going to press forward now. I'm not going to worry about my past sins. Why? They are nailed to the cross, Walt sang tonight. The blood of Jesus has washed them away. And I, as a sinful, weak man, by Christ's sacrifice and blood, am brought together with God. And the smile of heaven falls on me. There's a rainbow in the sky through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you don't have to observe that anymore. And then there's the day of Pentecost. Oh, interesting study is how all this stuff comes together. There are folks standing around talking about I'm waiting on the Holy Ghost. Do you understand God's word? Yeah. Well, why don't you do it? Got to wait on the Holy Ghost. Well, what do you think the Holy Ghost is going to do? What you don't realize is the Holy Ghost has been here ever since the day of Pentecost. Lord says, I go away and he will come. He came. And yet we stand around waiting. He's waiting on us. Holy Ghost has shown you the truth because the Bible says when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He's shown you the truth and now he's waiting because he's not going to force you. And you waiting too and he's waiting and you waiting. Pentecost, nailed to the cross. I'm glad I don't have to go to Jerusalem. Here's another one, circumcision. Now the average male child today is circumcised, but for physical and not spiritual reasons. Would you say amen out there? There was a time when there were deep spiritual implications. The clipping of the flesh symbolized the fact that when Jesus comes into the heart, he cuts away the flesh. 
the carnality of man makes him instead of a carnal creature a spiritual creature would you say amen a lot of folks in the church today need circumcision, but they don't need this kind. What they need is that spiritual circumcision. And the only thing that I know can bring it about is the word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts and divides us under. And when we make up our minds to do what the word of God says, there is a spiritual circumcision. There are too many carnal people in the church today. They discredit Christianity. They make a laughing stock of the most holy faith they excuse every conceivable sin and try to hide it under the cloak of religion they are carnal and not spiritual Jesus nailed that to the cross he said now it's the work of the Holy Ghost people writing me won't know can they look at this movie and can they watch rock and roll and can they go you can do anything you want to do as long as you're in the flesh and once you have the spiritual circumcision that we're talking about you won't even want to do it that stuff is cut away. Would you say amen out there? Oh yeah, he nailed it to the cross. We got to go on now and get it together. Then there was the feast of unleavened bread. I'm not going to even take the time to explain all these. I wish I could. It's beautiful. All of it symbolic. All of it pointing to something wonderful. Then there was the wave offering, which typifies the resurrection. Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept. And when he came up out of the ground, he didn't come up by himself. The Bible says other graves were shaken open. And then Paul said when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. He took some folks to heaven with him. And they're up there now. Well, you know Enoch is up there because the Bible said so. And we know Moses is up there because the Bible says so. And we know that Elijah is up there because the Bible says so. But when Christ arose, he led captivity captive. And John in the Revelation said, he looked around the throne and he saw not only Moses, Elijah, and Enoch, but he saw the four and twenty elders which were redeemed from the earth. Well, what are they doing up there? They are the first fruits of the wave offering. They are up there to prove to those unfallen worlds and to angels and to us by faith that the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus was efficacious and that because he is risen from the dead, he is able to bring folks from the dead and the proof is at the throne tonight I don't have to worry about my mother coming up out of that cold cold ground when Jesus comes I know he's able to raise the dead because he already did <laughs> I told you I wasn't going to explain it I almost did burn offerings peace offering <laughs> won't just nail them when you get ready then there is the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, I, if I had them all up here, you couldn't get them on that cross. I'm just trying to show you what we don't have to obey. Then there's the trespass offering. And it goes on and on and on ad infinitum. If you'd like to read them, go to the book of Leviticus and read them to your heart's content. That's what Jesus nailed to the cross. Now I'm going back and read you a text. I'm going to read you a text I already read you. And I hope it's going to flash like a light and become crystal clear. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, all them meat offerings, in drink, or in respect of an holy day, atonement, Pentecost, Passover, or of the new moon, certain things had to happen on certain days of the month, or of the Sabbath days. Now here's verse 18, listen now, I mean verse 17. Let no man judge you in these things, which, there's a transition there, we ain't through yet. Lord's going to tell you which holy days and which Sabbath days and which offerings he's talking about. If I say to you, go out there and open the door of the car, and if I stop right there, it'd be stupid, wouldn't it? You wouldn't know what I was talking about. But if I say, go out there and open the door of the car, which is parked right next to the door, and which is red, and which is a Buick, and which has a CB antenna on it, but no CB. If I told you that, it would make sense, wouldn't it? So the Lord is saying, don't let anybody judge you in holy days and Sabbath days and new moons and all of those things, which, verse 
verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. There it is. Say amen. St. Paul said, we were divided. But Jesus came and tore down the middle wall of petition. You see, you couldn't even come to our church. And that's the way it was. Gentile come to the temple would be stoned to death. Couldn't even join the church without hope. Cast off in the world. Aliens to the household of faith. Paul said, you were there and we were here. And there was a wall built up between us. And that's the wall, the law of Moses. It was contrary to us. It was against us. But he came and tore down the wall. And took it out of the way. Making of twain. What twain? Jew and Gentile. Male and female. Bond and free. Whosoever will. One flesh. In Christ Jesus. I know that's clear. Let's say amen. Let's cut the lights out. And let's spend ten minutes on the screen to tell you what I told you. Because I don't want you to miss this. When you hear all of these mixed up and confusing explanations, may God at least make your mind clear. What was nailed to the cross? The ceremonial law of the Jews. Back before there was such a thing as a Jew, the patriarchs offered sacrifices. They built altars and they killed lambs and they burned them. Every time a lamb died, listen now. Every time a lamb died, it pointed to the Lamb of God. Would you say amen? There are two distinct codes of law set forth in the Bible. The moral law. And the ceremonial law. Amen. I've got a statement in my Bible written by Billy Graham in which he says this as clearly as it can be said. We're not the only folks who know this. You hear what I said? There are two laws set forth. One is ceremonial and the other is moral. God's law is universal. The ceremonial was for the Jew only. And it had to do with a man who had sinned. He had to buy a lamb. And I'll get to that a little later on. But it all pointed to Jesus. Now, when the Jews gathered around Mount Sinai, God gave Moses this law and Moses preached it to the people. I'm going to rush through this because I've already told you. First of all, in Deuteronomy 33, 4, it says, Moses commanded us a law. In 2 Kings 21, 8, Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. If that's clear, say amen. Now, it says in 2 Chronicles 35, 12, And they removed the burnt offerings that they might give according to the divisions of the families of the people to offer unto the Lord as it is written in the book of Moses and so did they with the oxen. Leviticus 7.37 This is the law of the burnt offering of the meat offering and of the sin offering and of the trespass offering. Oh, there's so much of it. I just put a lot of it up here so that you could see it. Uh, Leviticus 4.32 Bring a lamb for a sin offering. Exodus 12.21 Take you a lamb and kill the Passover. Exodus 29.18 Thou shalt burn a burnt offering. Exodus 34.18 The feast of unleavened bread. Here is some more to convince you. Leviticus 3.6 A sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord. Leviticus 23.10, bring a sheaf of the first fruits. And then in Leviticus 23.27, there shall be a day of atonement. Exodus 34.22, thou shalt observe the feast of weeks. And on and on and on it goes ad infinitum. Aren't you glad? You don't have to fool with that tonight. Say amen out there. Oh, beloved, I'm not going to read all of these things. Let's go. Now, from John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church and one of my favorites, When I study, you know, I pick out men that I love. Wesley's one of them. Luther's one of them. St. Paul, one of them. Wesley says, the ritual or ceremonial law delivered by Moses to the children of Israel, containing all the injunctions and ordinances which related to the old sacrifices and service of the temple, our Lord indeed did come to destroy, to dissolve, and utterly abolish. But then he goes on to say, the moral law stands on an entirely different foundation from the ceremonial or ritual law. You know, some folk won't believe God, but they'll believe Wesley and they'll believe Billy Graham. So I read these things. He went on to say that 
the ceremonial law was only designed for temporary restraint upon a disobedient and stiff-necked people, whereas this, the law of God, was from the beginning of the world. Would you say amen out there? Here again, John Wesley, he said, In the highest rank of the enemies of the gospel of Christ are they who openly teach, What did our Lord do with the law? He abolished it. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Would you say amen, beloved? Now let's rush on. Here's another statement from John Wesley in volume 5, third edition of his works. It says, this handwriting of ordinances our Lord did blot out and take away and nail to the cross. Martin Luther's in his catechism. Question, are we under obligation to keep the ceremonial or church law of the Jews? Answer, no. The ordinances which it enjoined were only types and shadows. And I read to you in Colossians 2.17, the ones that God was talking about are those which were a shadow or a symbol or a type or a representation. Beloved, I just want to make God's word clear. If that is clear, let me hear you say amen. Martin Luther agreed. He said that Christ fulfilled these by his death. The ceremonial law was abolished because it was no longer necessary. Now, I've got dozens of these slides. I'm going to show you a couple. The moral law, Exodus 31, 18. He gave unto Moses tables of stone written with the finger of God. Written with what? On the other hand, the ceremonial law, Deuteronomy 31, 24. Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book. God's law was written on what? Moses' law was written in a what? God's law was written with his own what? Moses' law was written with his hand, the handwriting. Here's another, Deuteronomy 4. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire, even ten commandments. But in Leviticus 7, 28 through 37, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, This is the law of the burnt offering. God gave the moral law. Moses gave the law containing all these things. Now, in those days before Jesus, Now I want you to put yourself in this picture. In those days before Jesus, if you had committed a sin, you had to go get a lamb without spot or blemish. And then you had to take it to the sanctuary where you had to kneel down and confess that sin on the head of the lamb. It meant that you were the sinner, the lamb was innocent. You got it? Then they gave you a knife and you had to slit that animal's throat. Some of us can't even kill a chicken, can we? Aren't you glad? don't have to do that anymore then the blood was caught and carried into the sanctuary and that's how you had to do it but one day John the Baptist was baptizing and he looked through the crowd and he saw somebody coming and he said to that crowd behold that means look yonder here he comes who is it John the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world And Jesus lived amongst them as the sacrifice, as the lamb. And finally on that dreadful Passover weekend, they nailed him to a cross. They strung him up between God and man. He stayed up there from the sixth to the ninth hour. And finally, a voice, a scream of passion shivered up from the cross. He cried, it is finished. And the Bible says, when Jesus said that, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. And the Bible says it was rent or torn from the top to the bottom. If a man had torn that veil, he would have torn it from the bottom to the top. But God ripped this veil asunder. He was doing away with the old covenant, the law on stone. And it also included all of these sacrifices and offerings. He was instituting the new covenant, the law in the heart. Would you say amen? ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ it is finished and when that happened the priest was getting ready to kill a lamb because it was Passover time but when that temple started to shake and that veil began to tear the priest dropped his knife scared to death and the lamb was able to jump off the altar and run on out to freedom not necessary for that little old lamb to die now why out on dead man's hill the son of God had yielded up the ghost and died No longer do we have to kill lambs. Would you say amen, church? It is finished. And tonight, I don't have to go tell a priest my sins. Tonight, you don't have to come and tell me yours. We got a high priest. He's in the courts of glory. He is standing before the throne of God. And the Bible says, if any man sins, he's got an advocate with the Father. Let him come boldly to the throne of grace.
grace that he might find mercy to help in the time of need. Would you say amen, beloved? We've got a high priest, the Bible says, who is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. And the Bible says because he lived in the flesh, he knows how to deliver the righteous out of temptation. He knows how to succor them that are tempted. He knows what your troubles are because he lived in the flesh. He knows what temptation is because he was tempted. He knows what pain is because he endured pain. He knows what sorrow is. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He knows what it means to have your heart broken. He watched his loved ones laid in the tomb. Jesus went through everything we have to go through and he understands us. That's our high priest. Interested in you. Desperate to save you. The question is, how did we get so fouled up? Jesus nailed that to the cross. And people are trying to take it down. And nail up the Ten Commandments. Isn't it sad? If you understand God's word tonight, say amen. Now, having understood it, don't you want to do God's will? Don't you want me to pray for you? As I do night after night, that we'll do God's will? That's what I'm going to do. And I want everybody who is sincere about that to stand up right now. If you're not sincere, keep your seat. You don't have to stand. There's no pressure on you and you don't have to be embarrassed. But if you mean it, I just want to know who I'm praying for. Let's bow our heads now and lift our hearts with understanding and intelligence toward God. We don't need any hysteria. Don't need any emotional stimuli. We need to think for religion starts with a decision. To accept Jesus and his word and to throw out every other extraneous thing. Oh Lord, oh Lord, first thing I want to do is thank you. want to thank you for dying for our sins. want to thank you for your grace. None of us is born righteous, no not one. If anybody here is living the good life, it's because of your grace. If anybody here is free from sin, it's because of your grace. If anybody here is without guilt, it's because you have paid it all. So I want to thank you, Lord. And I want to worship you. And Lord, you know my heart. I'm not important all I am is a voice crying in the wilderness. I'm trying to attract people to you and not to me. I want people to see Jesus. I want them to understand his word. That's what I want, Lord. I don't want their money. I don't want flattery. And you know it. And so as one whom thou hast called, and in whose mouth thou hast placed the truth. I stand and plead for my people that are here tonight with their heads bowed. Everyone who stood has responded to a specific appeal. And he is saying to you, Lord, he wants to serve you and to do your will. And Lord, we got to have help. Because we can't do it by ourselves. So take note of us and bless every soul according to his need. And give to everyone the courage of conviction. Give to everyone an awareness that heaven and earth may pass away, but your will will stand. And that it doesn't profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. Oh God, bind us tonight through our consciences and convictions. And let us see Jesus dying. When we think we have to suffer, when we think it gets hard to do right, 
Let us see Jesus dying for we have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Oh Lord, encourage our hearts through Christ. And may we know that you will never fail your people who do your will. Now Lord, it's closing time. And if all my words were cast before thee together, they couldn't do a thing. You love us already. You are desperate to save. Do with us as thou wilt. Have mercy on us. Make us what we ought to be. We beg in the name of the Lamb of God that nailed our sins to the cross. There is someone who cares. From Moses' law, we are free. There is someone who cares. He nailed it to a tree. There is someone who cares. His blood now ransoms thee. That someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares, and he's the one who died. There is someone who cares. Behold his riven side. There is someone who cares. Now in his will abide. For that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May he cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In your hearts, in your homes, the peace that comes through knowing him. Tomorrow night, our subject will be the wicked woman and the simple man. Don't let anything keep you from this place where God will join us in worship. Oh, precious Lord, bring us back safely, I pray. In thy name, humbly. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor C.D. Brooks speaking at the Breath of Life Crusade number 2 in the greater Washington, D.C. area. International copyright, 1986, American Cassette Ministries. All rights reserved. This series of 30 cassettes is protected by international copyright and thus protected by federal law against all copying, duplication, and transcriptions. Please understand it is unlawful to copy this cassette for any purpose. For additional copies of this important series, catalog number BL3, entitled Breath of Life Crusade Number 2, as well as other cassettes by Pastor C.D. Brooks, please write to American Cassette Ministries, Post Office Box, 922 Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The postal zip code is 17108 in the United States of America. And for information regarding scheduling an American Cassette Ministry seminar in your area, featuring Pastor Stephen Wallace, Carol Zarska, Michael Curzon, Pastor Robert Gale, Alexander Snayman, Dr. George Akers, Dr. Agatha Thrash, or Amelia Connectly, please write or call us today. Waiting to serve you, this is American Cassette Ministries. We're a nonprofit corporation helping prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. <laughs>